<laughs> cool. Yeah, put me on speaker. Very cool. Yo, what's going on? It's looking good. I got, um, yeah, yeah, it's looking good. Uh, I I'm watching multiple screens, getting multiple audio feeds coming in due to two, two different feeds and two different ears. I'm watching the live chat. I got everything coming in. So I'm your, I'm your virtual. <laughs> yes. That's exactly what's going on. The vibes are good. The vibes are really, really nice right now. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm just doing my best to bring the virtual uh, back into this uh, less virtual space over here, where you guys are actually like meeting up in uh, in a meet space. So I'm your, uh, I'm your uh, de virtual host. The vibes are pretty cool. We got some jokes going. We got some reacts. We got uh, DMs coming in. So yeah, it's looking good. It's looking, it's looking real good right now. Sure. Yeah. I mean, this is something I've been really, really interested in for a long time. Um, the urban dictionary definition of devirtualization is when you meet somebody off of the internet and meet up in real life. Um, for me, I, I started kind of thinking about this idea after the, the uh, housing crash of 2008 through um, um, a series of manipulated photographs called the Blind House series, which you can see one of them is right behind me which also um, shows up in the codex um, with my essay. And basically the idea was that after 2008, the physical space started to become contorted to match with this virtual uh, system of debt that was pushing things forward and everything else had to kind of contort and conform to that. Um, so instead of a simulation, the virtual was coming back into real life. So it was becoming devirtualized. Since then, I've kind of thought about it in many different ways. And um, through this Codex project, yeah, there you go. There's the, there's the piece in the book. Um, through the Codex project, I've kind of started to think about it um, in terms of what can the virtual not deliver upon? So the, the, the uh, virtual chat rooms can do so much to connect people so fast across the globe. 
um, out of time. You can edit things, you can rearrange things, but then things can get lost to time. It's really hard to go back and find that chat that was really great and really kind of like made you feel something. So the Codex project was an attempt to de-virtualize those things and bring them into bring them into real physical space again and give us something that we can kind of hold on to um, as we move forward. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what my piece is about is kind of making a case for why this is a, is a good term to be using or kind of an idea to be throwing around as a way to push past um, post-structuralism and maybe everything isn't all hyper-reality in virtual space and maybe there are kind of connections between the virtual and the real now. So that. It's raining sand. Great, sounds good. Everybody in the chat, um, just send me stuff and I will uh, bring it forth back into the uh, meetup. So uh, troll me in the chat. All right, see you guys later. Hey, my name is Daniel, and um, th this is the story. So I took a train last year, it was maybe in May, April, I took a train from uh, Zurich to Basel in Switzerland, and when I got off the train at around 11 uh, p.m., I was the only person in the train and also in the whole train station. It was, um, that was an awkward experience. Yeah, but the thing that I, I miss most was uh, contingency zufall in German, and something falls on you, and, and that just now everything is algorithms, prognostics, numbers, entitlement. Everything is under control, and I hope it's um, it's not continue like this. And ciao, it was nice talking to you. Ciao, ciao.
Thank you, Little Internet and uh, Carly and Dan in Berlin. This is Little Internet clone number three on the Jupiter base of new models. And this is the Carly clone on the Jupiter base. I'm just Daniel, not a clone. <laughs> I'm Luis. I'm Matis, and I prefer to be a clone as well. <laughs> okay. Well, we are excited to now speak about the design of this object. Um, we've de-virtualized a year on a server, and so we thought we could just take a second and hear about the process of creating, precipitating, as we've been saying, precipitating an object from the from the metaverse. As a way of beginning, I mean, this is all your fault, Lath. We're here because of you. I think. I'm glad to you. <laughs> I think I got a, a, a Discord message from you about nine months ago saying, why don't we make a book? And our thought was, if you do it, we'll support it. But definitely thought there was about a 2% chance you would. One quick comment. It, wait, the book took literally as long as it takes for a baby to, <laughs> to gestate and be born? So Not far from that. I think it was around like six, seven months in total. Yeah. So from end of October to, I guess, now. Maybe we could just start with you, Leith, just with your thoughts. What compelled you to have this idea? And what also gave you hope that we could actually complete it? I think at first it was just like a, a shot in the dark and I just didn't really know where it would kind of get. Um, I think what motivated me to uh, reach out and, uh, and try to make this happen was just that, I mean, as everyone would just spend a lot of time online and spending time on the server, what was interesting about it, I feel, was just this sort of form of um, collective knowledge creation, uh, uh, if you can speak about it in those terms, and, and th there was already like a very kind of collaborative dynamic in the server um, that I felt one was maybe probably interesting to document and uh, compile some of the discussion uh, that happened there in like a physical form or like in, uh, in a book. And there was also maybe a opportunity to kind of uh, create re new relationships or like uh, uh, accelerate collaborations within the space. So that was that was November. Uh, maybe even can you say a word about the initial, like how you initially developed a team and like what those initial discussions were? Because you look at a server, I mean, there's way too many channels. Um, it's how would you even begin to go about parsing what value was on a server? What was some of the initial strategy? And Matisse too, if you want to chime in. I mean, it wasn't so thought through. So what I did was that I just tagged everyone. Um, and just so, I mean, a lot of people were very enthusiastic about the project, right? There was like a lot of reacts and everyone was like, yeah, super cool. And, and we just had like a meeting maybe two weeks later and uh, with around like something like 10 people. I could just add that I think what was really interesting is that uh, we were all in a way uh, trying it for the first time. So there were no preconceptions about what this thing should be or how should we structure. So there was, let's say, what I also made this process interesting was that it was a lot of, let's say, discovery, and, and we were discovering things on the go. And also, like, the, the whole way that the book is structured now emerged throughout, I don't know, months of uh, discussions. Are, are you going to be making a book about the making of the book? <laughs> nah, it's too meta. Yes. <laughs> But that's way too much. But, 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 but yes, the webdex like, uh, kind of is a book about making the book. Well, no? the webdex, no. yes, the webdex is is also coming soon. Stay tuned, August first, Kunzverka. But I think there is an idea to debrief uh, because a lot yeah. of people who are working on this book, myself included, were engaging with certain kinds of global supply chains or professional production services. Maybe not for the first time, but for the first time in a focused way in a while. And of course, these global supply chains are constantly changing. Um, and I mean, down to even getting the packaging supplies for this and having to deal with Amazon misrepresentation of, of puffed envelopes and them getting the, the dimensions wrong by a couple millimeters in your whole packet, you know. So I think that we are actually maybe going to make some kind of document. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah. D definitely document, the, not making a book about yeah. the making of a book. Which a guy. Would, yeah, yeah, a guy. Would, yeah, but, but at least produce or like document some sort of like reflection on the overall process. And, and, and I mean, it, it, it's going to be about different things, I guess. Uh, one of them is just like self-publishing in, in general and the other is also just like self-publishing in a very specific kind of media context uh, or like a very specific kind of space uh, because otherwise you'd find resources and self-publishing pretty much all over the internet but there's something about it that's just specific and I think important to both document and also reflect on. I think there are two aspects uh, that we could probably debrief about. This, the question of how to organize the whole process, uh, how to uh, maybe subdivide uh, labor, uh, how to maybe plan the whole process without maybe resorting to some kind of too draconian uh, managerial uh, techniques on one hand but on the other hand still 
managing to produce uh, uh, a tangible object on more or less uh, set uh, date, which I think is a great challenge, but also really interesting. So and I think I hope that. Uh, one of the outcomes would be really this kind of like, I don't know, uh, managerial theory of, of, of swarm publishing. <laughs> right, yeah. Do you call it swarm publishing? Is that what you call it internally? What have you been referring we, to? We it? didn't coin the right term yet. It just flows in. Yeah, because yeah, I do think like, yeah, establishing best practices for this is like one of the best uh, achievements of all of us probably or that, that could come out of this because yes, like all these other communities you're talking about, I'm, I think that there, this will be a new model of like <laughs> precipitating Discord communities, which is, you know, a thing that needs to be solved. So so I do think like, yeah, it'll be probably useful and interesting to see like what other communities like adopt this model and jack our flavor, so to speak. No, but I, mean, I, I, th I think also it's important to note that probably if you look, look into history, probably, I don't know, I don't know how whole Earth Catalog was produced uh, and what was the actual group dynamic or publications of, of that era, for instance, but probably if one spends a bit of time uh, in kind of like, you know, historical uh, uh, study, you could probably find quite a few models that, that were employed That's in like, collective production and, and so on, probably also from the art world, uh, I imagine, also from the architecture world. Uh, so it would be interesting maybe to also try to contextualize what we did because probably there are many things that uh, have been already kind of yeah, uh, no, theorized. It definitely fits into a lineage of collaboration and collaborative practice in general for sure. But it does seem like a, a genuinely new yeah. iteration of that. So and It's just like a very specific moment in time. And right. Yeah. Can we just speak for a moment about the object form? I think it's interesting. You, you bring up Whole Earth Catalog, Radical Software is in my mind, but also Julian. Well, I remember I got a uh, War and Peace in the Global Village, which was like a follow-up to uh, McLuhan's the, the Medium is the Massage. Uh, and they were just like this very mass market, very inexpensive uh, kind of, of book that you could find anywhere, any city in the country. And so we kind of took that. Uh, I, I always thought like, well, if we did a book, uh, it would be great to follow this model. Uh, and of course, the, the McLuhan book said, you know, there'd be short text and then there'd be images and collage and combinations of text and images. And it really was sort of a, uh, you know, a book that is rich in theory, but also was really looking outward, really looking to a mass market, really not being precious about, about it. I guess our book is a, a little bit thicker. We'd have uh, uh, had, a, had a bit more to say than McLuhan uh, for the New Models <laughs> Codex, but we, um, but it does very much still feel it feels both mass market and uh, very interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that the, the flipping through medium is a massage. There's this like cinematic quality to the book that you feel like you are in a movie, and it, and it runs like one storyline. Unfortunately, a different image and text, but everything feels somehow connected. And what I find quite fascinating with with the Codex is that uh, it kind of feels more disjointed, and and there are these like. It's almost like walking through a building that sometimes is like some, some wall is placed in the middle of a corridor or, or something that uh, kind of like surprises <laughs> you unexpectedly uh, in a good way, uh, never trapping you, but always enabling you. Uh, ah, good thing, Shuri. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh. Yeah. yeah, good energy, good energy. It's always yeah. add in a good way at the end of anything you're saying. Exactly. <laughs> Can we just for a second talk about some of the specific features in the book? Because there's a lot of interesting strategies. Maybe one thing um, that I find interesting or, or maybe also relevant uh, uh, to the topic of the book is uh, the syndemic chapter. Um, that is this kind of like overarching chapter. So it's one chapter, but it just goes throughout the whole book. And it's also the kind of like its own sort of like narrative. It's just a chapter built out of like headlines of the news throughout the year so you basically start the book in january and finish it in december 32nd um so i, I feel that's kind of one interesting part or like a, a, a way that the book functions which is maybe not so or like common or or, or a, a standard let's say in the beginning when we des uh, developed the table of contents because again no one really knew how to structure the book uh, and the page count kept uh, fluctuating up and down in the end up. Uh, basically, at some point, the idea was just to have 12 chapters to represent 12 months with 12 different kind of topics. Uh, and of course, gradually we had to kind of optimize that. Uh, but the dynamic uh, remained as this uh, almost as a kind of like metaphor for the whole 2020, right? There was this thing that was coming to the forefront and then disappearing when the summer came and then came back again as a, as a, as a second and third wave and so on. So, so in a way, you could say that there are like multiple narratives running through the book and uh, whichever page you open, you can kind of stumble upon like different things happening that not necessarily belonging to chapters. And I would say that this is a book where it's not almost like meant to be read, but it's more about kind of like consuming it and almost like flipping through and finding and discovering things. Yeah, it was not about kind of, I guess, having like a very well-polished project. I guess that's also what is interesting about it. It's just messy, but it's nice. 
I mean, when you read it, it's not so messy, but the process was, but in, in a good way. Yeah. In a good way. <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> yeah. There's information in that, you know, again, this Keller Easterling entanglement, it's very data rich in the sense that there is a lot of entanglement. There is, the mess has information in it. And I think maybe that sounds like, I don't know, some kind of platitude, but I really think it's true that the object form of the book is as informative as the written content within it. So the two work in synthesis. Okay, maybe this is a tangential comment to the discussion, but I think that mess is really important. Yeah, in totally. I feel that, especially in book design, but also in many things, including uh, many kind of uh, issues discussed in the public sphere. I think there's almost too much uh, kind of temptation to achieve quick clarity, quick uh, quick conclusions for things. Uh, so it seems that many things are kind of getting more and more kind of like dumbed down just to kind of arrive at some kind of tangible conclusion. Refinement culture. This is anti-refinement, yeah, so except for the cover, which is very refined. It's very refinement <laughs> culture. <laughs> it's over refined. Uh, yeah, but basically, so I think that uh, we, we need more mess, and I think we should try to kind of like find value in, 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 in that mess and again gain new insights from from that mess and maybe feel just more comfortable with the fact that mess exists thank you both so much for the i don't know like 10,000 hours like some insane amount i think there were multiple days where you didn't sleep at all yeah like. we didn't <laughs> mention it but the invoice is coming very soon yeah <laughs> 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 right. <laughs> Buy the book so we can our afford account, it. Uh, our accountants will get in touch with yeah, you. <laughs> <laughs> now back to the studio live in Berlin with uh, my DNA father. <laughs> <laughs> Silence, noise. This project, this model, this book or publication moves out from and with a discord. In the 21st century of whatnots, post-truths and context collapses, old models of media and communication are rapidly being evacuated and exhausted. The podcast indexing the once ubiquitous iPod, originally the I needed this piece of tech to connect to the pod, indicates something of this emptying out. People in pods, sequestered, tethered in a world of their own. The pod is an echo chamber by design. An echo chamber is actually a kind of noisy space. Noise reverberates and this reverberance is discordant. In 2019, new models launched a Discord for community paywalled by a Patreon subscription. Reverberations are always a bit of a racket. But in this case, the racket had a payoff, not only for those being patronised, 
these discordants became noisy collaborators on new models content, amped up and producing new circuits of discussion rather than retreating old loops, the fake, cancel, cringe and the cycles of Web 2.0. Discordance were soon shouted out and invited on to the mainstream of the podcast and the podcast hosts joined in the narrow cast of channels ranging from COVID aesthetics to new tropics. It's funny that upon arriving in the discord, new members are placed into a channel dubbed trolls screaming into the void. If successful, one emerges an NM gang member, a discordant, who is not averse to discourse. For all the chaotic chime-ins on the channel scape, arguments and dialogues developed. Very few, if any, trolls persisted. The addition of shitpost containment channel, no doubt, worked as a useful troll desublimation valve. The usually silent discordant, the person in pod, the Patreon meta provider, became a partner in production. Certainly, gang members work in the constitution of discourse here, taken as the social bond between speaking subjects, a bond which becomes ever more vital in a time when IRL noisiness is curtailed via lockdowns and cancellations. Between the pod and the cord lay newmodels.io. The movement between these spaces was spirited and sometimes antagonistic in the clown move sense. That is, as a fluid state where noise is worked through, struggled over even, to make meaning. In 2020, when some bodies, perhaps not before used to being locked down, were in forced seclusion, questions of who and what to signal boost came to the fore. An opportunity to publish a translation of work by a prominent but controversial European intellectual on the .io was swiftly critiqued in the discord. Social bonds, tethers, tightened and even frayed over questions of which noises were apparently raised to the level of signal and whose voices this elevation might silence. Tuning in to translation, marking spaces and words across time zones always results in a kind of loss of context and local significance. The result? A muddling of the signal to noise ratio with strong call outs on the Discord and a recontextualizing of the article on the .io. Not silenced, but a signal distortion in what otherwise might have potted off into an echo chamber. Such disruptions can be lessons. Antagonism, indeed, discord is vital for maintaining these tethers, these bonds requisite of animating the social. Sometimes cords need to be cut in order to rethink and rebuild what words, headlines, noise and silence mean. Thank you.
starting again. I'm going to read my essay from the chapter going outside. 2020, we have become anesthetized. Francois Bonnet's book, After Death, published in August of 2020, provides a useful analysis for a year spent online in unending anticipation of a future that was already here. A displacement of limits has always been present in online spaces where our capacity to absorb the immaterial expanded ever wider as to nearly obliterate our corporal boundaries. This is the unreal numbing effect of anesthesia. It is what renders us as, in Bonet's framework, projected beings. The unimpeded accommodation of this state of projected being applied considerable pressure on the collective mind of the New Models Discord in 2020. It took shape in the recurring discussions of bodies, finite beings per Bonet, which then became discussions of death, in particular, whose death would hold value and in what way. Outside of those discussions, we succumb to further surveillance and physical distance in an environment where our time and ability to affect change grew increasingly limited. April. Fem coordinated a group chat in the New Model Live channel to discuss two texts that dealt with death and its current unreality. The first was Toby Shoren's essay, Premonitions, published on his blog, Subpixel Space. Written in the early days of COVID-19, the essay is meant to be as uncertain about its observations and the future as the title implies, suggesting, among other things, that it's only a matter of time before the profiles of the dead exceed the amount of living profiles across social networks, and companies will develop means by which revenue can be generated from the non-content producing dead. The other text was Owning Necro Waste, a paper by Dr. John Troyer of the University of Bath's Center for Death and Society. Dr. Troyer examines the question of who owns the parts of the dead body categorized as waste by taking a closer look at what is classified as waste and identifying who can extract value from it. Both texts suggest that the limits imposed by death as we understood them to exist were being pushed further from our grasp. I wanted to discuss this when I called into chat, specifically that the data we have been generating could be considered necro waste and what the implications of this were. Vocal discourse embodies our projected beings. Suddenly humbled in this non-projected space of conversation, neither of my prepared points were articulated on the call. However, my questions found their answers during other discussions on the Discord throughout the year. July, I make a link. Fem hosted the Celeration podcast discussing the rights of nature movement, featuring an interview with members of the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights, CEDAR. CEDAR is an organization that advocates for land to have representational rights, a precedent for which has already been established with the rule of corporate personhood. Cedar attorney Thomas Lindsay expressed urgency at passing this sort of legislation. While concerned advocates argue about recognizing nature as human, corporations already perceive it that way. In advance of any organized effort to protect nature by granting it legal personhood, corporations in Florida lobbied for a state preemption law to ban any future right of nature efforts to prevent corporations from further resource extraction. While we're absorbed in heated online debates, and not actually changing policy, corporatocracy is changing the laws to paralyze us from moving forward. October, a tweet appeared on the Discord, an attempt to force change from the virtual space. It featured a CGI animation of Joaquin Oliver, a teenager who was killed in the Parkland school shootings. Text flashes across the screen saying Joaquin was brought back for one last message for a campaign called Unfinished Votes meant to persuade people to vote in place of those who had lost their lives to gun violence. Seeing Joaquin's reanimated image continue to do work for a neoliberal agenda felt more dispiriting than inspiring. It looked like a step toward what Shorn predicted, while making clear that we are less able than ever to recognize death itself as a final limit. Like the Deceleration podcast, Joaquin's CGI showed that power has no problem removing limits before we're even able to reach them. I was projected back to my memories on our group call when the conversation had turned to the scope of the virtual. Members implored each other not to get swept up in the lure of it, while others just, and I remembered what I had felt like when I had to sign off. I hadn't wanted to. Whether we can admit it to ourselves or not, omnipresence and omniscience are highly valued qualities here. When I did manage to pull myself away, 
I typed my goodbye into the chat and received several reacts and a few comments acknowledging my departure. When I reread the chat later, I saw others had done the same upon their departure. It's nothing new saying goodbye online, but we do it so rarely in the discord that reading it there was oddly touching. There was a kindness present that is usually reserved for DMs. Maybe we should say goodbye on here more often. Remind each other that even if our projected beings might be forever subject to return, our finite beings are not. Thank you. And congratulations, Codex crew. I really wish I could be there with you tonight to celebrate. Ah. Abolish IRL, URL. If the internet was doomed from the start, as we were, doomed at birth, then with doom we are entangled, in sin and solidarity, with doom and chaos. Protest notification. Hashtag Black Lives Matter sign in post-protest photos, posted to be seen and to signal. Blackout Tuesday. What a time to be online. What a time to be black online. What a time to collect reparations online. Black feed, soul feed. Imagine Sisyphus happy. Imagine invisible people in black mirrors see their own reflections.
You're lucky, the driver said. The applications keep coming. We're growing so fast they bumped phase 4 expansion to 2024. I nodded silently. I had landed at the Kelowna airport an hour ago, about 100 kilometers north of the Canada-US border. I was hoping to get some rest, but the driver kept talking. Did you know our solar electricity grid provides enough energy to power not only the whole campus, but our entire fleet of Cybertrucks? The truck glided down the highway, shaded by a canopy of pines. We turned onto an unmarked road where a gate opened as we approached. We drove deeper into the forest until we came to a much larger gate beside a guardhouse. Massive walls stretched on either side deep into the forest. The driver waved at an armed guard who smiled and waved back before opening the gate. We kept going as the driver continued. We're driving through the quarantine zone. It's completely test driven and we're constantly pen testing our own defenses. Not that we'll need them anytime soon. After another checkpoint, we arrived at the main compound, stopping beside a sign. Programmatic Autonomous Community Project Limited, Phase 2. We take care of everything. We got out of the Cybertruck and it drove off to charge itself. I took in the complex, my new home, my new beginning. Everything looked vaguely high-tech, but I noticed it all must have been built around the old growth trees. A tall man walked towards us holding a clipboard and a travel mug. He was in his mid-thirties, had a trimmed beard, wireframe glasses, Patagonia jacket, and trousers almost as slim as he was. Hello, welcome. I'm Paul, VP of Lifestyle for the Pack Project. I'll show you around. Are you hungry? I shook my head. I had a bite on the plane. Paul laughed. You won't miss plane food. 90% of our food is grown on site. We've optimized our organic fertilizing aquaculture for flavor and nutrition. If you want to bite later, stop by the, rec Sorry, the restaurant cafe. As you know, it's all inclusive. The whole growing process is automated and super cheap to scale up. We kept walking as Paul told me I should consult the on-site nutritionist to determine my nutritional profile. His phone buzzed. He looked at it, frowned, and set it to silent. Paul asked how I heard about the pack project and I told him about finding the YouTube channel and listening to one of the podcasts. I became interested because of COVID-19. I don't want to beg a boss for remote work again when the next pandemic starts spreading. Paul nodded. Yeah, that's why we built this place. And because we run it as a private corporation, we have a lot more flexibility than the government when it comes to keeping us all safe. We continued, walking past rainwater filtration systems and slim towers that rose above the trees to expose solar cells, satellite dishes, and antennae. The buildings were simple, built from wood, concrete, and glass, and ornamented with plants and natural rocks. One window revealed the orange plastic domes of 3D printers, while another revealed a room of brewing tanks and stills attached to a brew pub. Paul kept checking his smartwatch, and I noticed her pace quicken. I always wanted to live out in nature, to go back to the land, Paul continued, but I'm gay and my partner Deck is trans, so we never thought we'd move to a small conservative town. But thanks to the security of the PAC project, we finally feel free. An entirely concrete building appeared on our right, with words etched into the walls. The survival of the collective requires self-reliance. A large screen advertised shooting and self-defense classes. You'll be working in epidemiology. Our threat model is constantly expanding and the data we gather is used to keep up with other units looking at global unrest and environmental indicators. And our in-house traders use it to determine what stocks and crypto to buy or short or whatever. That's how we afford all this, he waved his hands around. We neared the epidemiological research task force building, a glass cube with a wood frame. I noticed we had walked in a circle and were right back at the Cybertruck loading zone. A woman in a white lab coat and augmented reality glasses hurried out of the building. Hey, I've been trying to reach you, she said to Paul. That Ebola outbreak in Lagos? The strain's incubation time is much longer than 2014. Johns Hopkins is estimating an R0 about three times as contagious. Same as SARS-CoV-2, but that's with Ebola's 70% infection fatality rate. They've already found cases in Beijing, London, and Berlin. Shit, said Paul. His smile disappeared. Well, that's why we built this place, isn't it? I'll post an announcement to the Discord and alert the other VPs. What's happening, I asked. Sorry, continued the tour later. Paul strapped on a mask, and you better quarantine in your apartment for the next two weeks. Really sorry about this, but you understand. I nodded. This is why I signed up. Paul passed me a mask. As I walked towards the apartments, I heard him speak rapidly into his phone. Cancel and put a hold on all hotel bookings. Get the quarantine zone up to code. Notify the board of directors. Seth Stalbin from Houston, Texas. Certainly we were going through, uh, in the fall of 2020, a period of virtualization and trying to figure out what, how we could make something sustainable and how we could make a place, I guess. 
um, or quite literally an, an institution ultimately, um, where, where we could support this, this new form and find validation for it, both, uh, in the virtual space and the physical IRL space. We were really seeing most institutions struggling to do virtual programming online or trying to engage with an audience. And yeah, I mean, I was terrible or still am terrible at attending Zoom events, except for this one. I'll hopefully show up. I mean, or else I'm, I guess I'm here now. <laughs> I made it. <laughs> with the, the social justice movements and having to get into this really non selfish mode of thinking about other people by quite literally wearing a mask. And we really had to rethink about the way that we shape community, what makes community, what communities we'd like to build stronger. A project I really haven't talked about very much, um, which was a project that happened starting in about May of, of 2020 um, when a college friend of mine passed away. And she was from the Bronx in New York. And I really wanted to do something in her memory. So I, I contacted people like Devin Kenny and American Artist and found this whole new community and kind of a whole new set of friends that I've still never met in real life. Yeah, now we're, we're supporting a community organization in the Bronx called Odiosas. There's a guy who calls himself Norwood Community Library and is a street librarian and stands out on the corner and gives people books for free. We've bought laptops for a performing arts school in the Bronx for kids to learn remotely. It's been a really weird, fascinating way that I've been hyper-local in the Bronx without ever stepping foot Seth, this, in the you Bronx. Know, this Codex is happening thanks to the generosity of you and your family. Do you have any thoughts on, on the object now that it's out in the world? Well, I'm pretty excited. I've been trying to picture it and put, put all the little teasers together, piece it together on my own, but I think the, the object's really going to blow me away. I'm so proud. Congrats to everyone who's, who's made this thing finally real, and I can't wait to really, really have one. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Twitch stream. We're not actually on the Twitch stream. We are recording in advance of the New Models Codex launch. I wanted to contribute a memory from the past year, which has been, I imagine for most of us, the most crazy period of your life. Uh, <laughs> I think because we came from the art world in a very unique sort of way, one of the unintended bonuses of moving from producing gallery artworks to, to producing podcasts and live streams is that there's a whole community of talented people who collected around this thing and were very interested to contribute and forge meaningful connections and have conversations that were not happening in the art institutions or in reading groups or in galleries or anywhere else, frankly. So for me specifically, looking back at the last year, January 6th, the Capitol riot in the US. Coincidentally, that day, people were hanging out in the Discord because we had all been locked down for six months or, or I guess more by that point. And there's this moment where things are kind of happening online, but the news feed is very uncertain of what's going on. There are takes coming from all different angles. And the people that you really want to discuss this very urgent matter with are already in this space that they've been hanging out in for the past year. And it felt like a moment of where the media, <laughs> the punditry, uh, basically, basically everyone <laughs> really had no fucking idea what was going on at all. And the conversation in the Discord was more coherent than what was being posted to the newsfeed. Very surreal. Fucking boomers storming the Capitol on Nancy Pelosi's desk, putting their feet up. 
really, really bizarre shit. Um, hilarious, uh, bizarre, um, also dangerous, and I, I completely disavow, but uh, hilarious also. Um, and the conversation with our core group of friends was so much more meaningful and insightful uh, than, than anything else I could get anywhere else online. Um, I just felt really grateful to have that group of people. Uh, that, that, that's a very rare, very unique sort of thing. Hard to come by. 10 years in the art world, very rare that you get those types of meaningful conversations and, and meaningful connections. And um, yeah, I don't know much more to say about it than that, but um, it's been a transformative year and um, I feel very grateful for it. Uh, and I look forward to the year following. Hey. It's going good. It's going good. Um, the uh, the chat's going nuts. Live party room is going off. Um, a few, a few. Um... <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Put me on speakerphone. Let's get it going. Yeah, the chat's going nuts. We got um, a couple a uh, couple subcultures have grown up and dissipated in the course of the stream. There has been uh, schisms and factions, um, all kinds of crazy shit. Uh, when the stream was going out a little bit, we started uh, a, a sigil and we were charging the sigil, and we believe that that brought the stream back. So, so um, so yeah, we're happy about that.
No, it wasn't. It wasn't chaos magic. No, no, no. It's not. It's not chaos magic. It was um, disentropy magic. So it was very chaste. Just, just uh, you know. Hell yeah. Nope, nope. Sigil is still up. It's still up. If, if, if the stream goes down again, we can recharge it, so... Yeah, we can make a playbook. Yeah, I mean, the book is fireproof, so I mean, you could burn it and then, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we can work afterwards. So that's no problem. True. <laughs> um, I think that's it. I think I think I covered all the points, so you can you can take me off. Uh, all right, I'll all right, I'll check in later. <laughs> No, no problem. All right, catch you later. Cheers. Hello, this is the clones of Little Internet and Carly reporting in from the moon base where we are interviewing several members of the core Codex team. That's right. And Dan Keller is also there. Uh, I'm in my own there. pod. Dan the Vidora and Willy Wonka. He's also <laughs> looking for underage aliens to give chocolate to. <laughs> give candy, free candy written on the side of his Oh satellite. my God. Oh mm -hmm. my God. Okay. Well, we're, oh, wow. we're lucky to be joined right now by three members, three core members of the Codex team, Fim, Rosie, and Sarah. Could we start by having you each introduce yourselves, where you're calling in from, and also what your role has been in this project? Uh, I'm Sarah. I'm calling in from Austin, Texas. Uh, fast depleting the energy resources of the state. And uh, I was part of the editorial team, a little bit of production uh, for the Codex. Great, thank you. And Rosie? I am calling in from Singapore and I was part of the editorial team with Sarah and uh, I guess the broader Codex crew. Nice nails, Rosie. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, and Fim? Uh, I'm Fim, I'm calling in from the Great Lakes region. Uh, and I was involved in the production and some of the research uh, for the Codex. Excellent. So we've asked you three to, what are you going to say? Okay. Uh, we've asked you three to speak together because we wanted to talk a bit about the structure of this publication, because we know that this isn't just like a regular magazine. It's not like you have um, a, a, a group of, of paid editors who come to work nine to five. They commission writers who are then, uh, you know, on, on staff or in the field or whatnot. It's a very special kind of publication. So could you say in a line what uh, or two, what you imagine the core task task of editing something like this is. Right. It was looking at kind of the ways that we were together through 2020 and pulling out some of the larger themes of the discord and um, how we, how we talked about them. 
Yeah, I think um, the idea was to sort of have the Discord lead the editorial process. It was not kind of top down from the, the, the sort of crew who were leading it either. We were sort of constantly looping back. Yeah, absolutely. And Shim, we often think about the end product when we talk about editorializing, but in fact, making the codex was first about organizing people or even conducting people. I wonder if further to this question, if you could talk a little bit about the process, the logic, or perhaps even the score for creating the codex. Sure. Um, one thing that came up pretty early on was this, this keyword, the, the codex itself, um, the metaphor that I, I returned to was this idea of random access memory. Like that was like a new logic of the codex that wasn't there previously, whereas the scroll was this linear kind of development. And so I think that idea of referentiality and indexicality um, and the, the ability to kind of um, randomly access parts of the conversation that were happening in the server um, really found its way into the form of the codex. And then further to that, there's you know, a larger conversation about um, how that was executed and what kind of initiatives we took to orchestrate that or score that. I think people would be curious to know your strategy for tackling this massive data organization task, um, both practically, like, did you use special software? Uh, how did you handle the chain of command? Um, how did you organize it? Like if you were to give a tool set to somebody else, you know, any kinds of concrete details that you can share, I think would be interesting to hear. <laughs> It's it's funny because the process was actually very manual. So there wasn't a lot of automation, in fact. And I think you can actually kind of sense that in some ways. And it would be a stretch to say artisanal, but like, the, like <laughs> yeah, there's like artisanal memes. Like, uh, and like, the, yeah, you can see like the manual processing of the server. I mean, just to speak to like the manual process that I'm even recalling like this massive spreadsheet we had going for a long time of kind of all of the themes and ideas that we had generated from the re research channels and pushing it out to the community to see what resonated with them, uh, you know, see what they wanted to contribute along these lines. And it's interesting to kind of look back and see what did and what didn't make it in or, you know, things that we thought would be um, part of the project that, that weren't or that became part of it in a different way. Mm -hmm. And we had these um, swarm writing sessions, for instance, with the glossary and the, uh, what would you say, Discord-generated Reacts, which are exclusive to the new models um, Discord platform. Yeah, I also think that the point that Rosie just made really speaks to that question of how this was scored. I mean, we had a lot of conversation at the beginning of, do we want this to be a reflection of the server of the discord or do we want to solicit contributions on like topics? And, and in a lot of ways, the, the codex is kind of compositionally modeled off of some of the logics or the vernaculars of the platform in which we congregate. And I think that fits very much into the kind of themes that the, the new models project attempts to unpack. Yeah. The focus on vernacular, I think is really important. Um, you know, one of the things we've seen with the rise of web two was the siloing of conversations and the deployment of certain blank terms in highly politicized way. What we're seeing in this dark forest space, like new models is an embrace of vernacular, but also an attempt attempt to collectively define it in a very generative way, not in a way where it's like, I mean, weaponized is maybe too strong of a word, but like the idea of something being based. I mean, that's, that's something that I think had a, uh, like maybe a more reactionary connotation, but through the usage in new models became a term that was just a useful term to kind of like a harsh realism, yeah. a little bit on maybe can even be a bit insensitive, but it's not, it reflects more of a, 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 a it reflects a sort of energy or emotion or attitude behind a, a point. Ultimately, we're trying to organize or catalog or under, be able to find language to describe this current state in 
online driven politics. And I- right. And in a community like this, there's a chance to like come up with a common language, a shared language. And there's like a generosity towards the use of a term. It's not like, oh, you use that term. Therefore, you must be crypto fascist. It's like, what? What are you going to say? Just that words now seem to have like scripts that they execute. If this word is deployed, it means this, 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 you react this way, it's interpreted as this way. And I think the Discord provided a space where the, the those subroutines, those subroutines could be cut off mm-hmm. and the word could be sort of re-engineered. I was just wondering if we could talk a little bit more about macro collaboration governance uh, stuff, but um, were there any sort of like best practices for swarm publishing or collaboration that you think you've um, developed from the end of this and, and how much of that changed throughout the process? Um, how different was your process from the beginning to the end? I mean, I'll just like, just speaking off the cuff, like things that are coming up for me were like having a framework for like getting um, permissions and, and uh, how people want to be, um, identified or not identified. Uh, we were sort of figuring that out on the fly. And I think we kind of got that down finally, um, having a core group of people to make the final decisions and that just kind of had to happen. Um, and we didn't, we didn't really ever determine who those were going to be. We just kept showing up. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That makes yeah. a lot of sense. Proof of work. Yeah. Proof of work. As we say, <laughs> Yeah, I wonder if there's any other comments to that question. I also wonder if there's uh, t- if you all if you all did take a Myers Briggs personality test, of <laughs> the magic uh, personality types that are compatible or astrology. Maybe we're all your signs compatible to like. I, I always cause I always think of like horizontally democratic kind of things as like being. Uh, like you can't really get things done and you ended up getting something incredibly substantial done. So yeah. I think I that's like, one that's still, we ask because it's still a bit of a mystery. <laughs> how, you yeah, how do you get it. past the torpor? I mean, maybe Femme and Rosie have a different idea of this, but I feel like the, the only thing that I can remember that happened was like early on in some meeting, we all just said what we were interested or capable of working on, whether it was like editing or designing or writing or something like that. And, and then we just stuck to it. Producing a the virtualization, producing an object is like so much more complicated than screen space would suggest. We forget like what a global supply chain actually is like to interact with. So yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it's for considering that it's phenomenal how this object oh, turned it's out. Like there, it has no business being this like professional and good. And- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it is really it's, crazy. It's yeah. It's, it, it, uh, it doesn't quite make sense. Yeah. It's very, it very cool. Way. It's very, very good. Yeah. You'll be so, um, you will be very excited. Although, you know, the, 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 the seams too, we're so used to thinking in the digital man that we forget that things are bound together with <laughs> spaces. Thank you, Rosie and Sarah and Fim for your words here. And of course, for the book and we'll be seeing you soon in the metaverse and elsewhere. And um, yeah, can't wait for the next productions to come from this team. Thank you Thanks, for joining guys. us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.
hey, what's up? It's Trevor McFedry from Bread. Um, talking about 2020 vibe shifts, I've been probably most intrigued by the kind of more macro trend of my peers who were pretty hostile towards the idea of markets existing in their lives, uh, recognizing that they could actually be used as a weapon. And you know whether it's coming together to buy Doge or AMC or GME to stick it to hedge funds, this idea that the capital and capital markets could be a more effective weapon than some of the grassroots stuff they've been exploring over the last four years, it's really intriguing to me. And I think it's a trend we're going to see more and more of, especially as the kind of pendulum swings from protecting investors, um, telling them to participate inside of private markets. Um, obviously, that's, that's that's correlated and kind of a works in hand in hand with stuff like crypto and some things we're seeing. But I'm, I'm more intrigued by um, people exploring some of the stuff on climate, whether it's oracles that allow us to kind of bet on climate stuff or to create incentives for people who have power to create some of the change we need around climate and other major issues, but capital as a weapon um, is intriguing to me. All right. Well, welcome. Um, yeah, how's everybody doing? So I'm over here in uh, Alston, Boston, and we got Orla over there in um, Berlin. And yeah, so we threw together this the Stonks chapter because we just we just had to do it to them. And um, my kind of interest in putting together this chapter for the Codex was a way to try to understand stonks um because i don't really understand it that well i basically everything i know is from listening to dan talk about it on the podcast so i thought if we put together this chapter that would kind of help distill it um was that was that uh, your feeling about it as well orla oh yeah i mean totally i think i remember like putting but saying okay right fine i'll do stonks because no one else has done it and then being, and then like going into the the songs like channels and being like, what the hell is this world? Like this ulterior universe that has just been like going crazy during the pandemic on our on this Discord. And um, and what it, we I think we both agreed about this like these sort of um, the weird events that would happen in the stock market or the weird sort of like manifestations or whatever on it sort of became like markers for real real life you know like in the beginning when we were on like log levels it's like infections per day the death rates and you're really looking at these little data points trying to make sense of what's going on and then it kind of could correspond or or, or it could be replicated uh, in the stock market you know like you would see for instance like are you sharing the screen yeah Yep. Yeah, we got the screen up, so we can just dive right into that. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, I mean, this one's showing. Uh... Yeah. So these were like a couple like key moments of 
reality and the stock market kind of becoming even more detached than ever um, that were collected for the stonks chapter. So we can kind of just go through them. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think like we, in the codex, like there's also dispersed through art, like the syndemic chapter, which is kind of like a timeline of everything that happened um, during 2020. And we, we then just thought that that could be a nice format, right? For, for the Stong's chapter is to like, yeah, look at these world events that happened during the time and how it kind of spiraled out of control uh, towards the end of it. Um, I don't know, what, what, what way are you sharing this? I just see like the corner of a page. I, I, I think maybe. Uh, well, yeah, I, um, it's not the full spread. It's like half the spread. So you got to get the book to, to get the other half the spread. So this is a uh, corner of the page <laughs> that I screenshot. Um, but yeah, so this one was Zoom's net worth reaches more than the top seven airline companies combined. Yeah. That so, was and it's so funny. I was checking yesterday when I was here in the studio with everyone and, um, Zoom has like, like net like has net lost a significant amount of money and like the airlines are obviously all back up again the line goes up because you know we can all travel now and it's great um and zoom is kind of like not doing so well anymore so this was this was really a crazy moment like where you know the we're not leaving we're all locked down um and we just see like the the the, the airline stocks just tank except maybe for the ones in america that were like propped up by the uh, the fed but uh, and then Zoom is just like skyrocketing. And then again, it's funny when the vaccine is announced, um, how Zoom shares then begin to crash a little bit, you know? Well, the market yeah. sort of general, yeah. Big that time. So this one is uh, future markets soar as Joe Biden is named president of USA, Pfizer Group announces COVID-19 vaccine. Yeah, um, that, was, that was, do you also remember like everyone thinking that it was a conspiracy that um, that Pfizer or whatever, like held back the announcement of finding the vaccine? Yeah, yeah it announced the, the day after he was confirmed right. um, as winning the, the election. Yeah, no. I think it's true. So this one is uh, citing impending crisis of water scarcity CME NASDAQ launch trading on water futures. Yeah. So. You can sort essential resources now, which is what a, what a time to be alive. <laughs> this, Just, I think, yeah, this was the most, uh, yeah, I, like I didn't really know how to feel when I read this, you know, because like it's crazy on in, in the in the world of stones, let's say anyway, it is it is wild and this sort of like unbridled like capitalism it really is it, you can like you can just see it in its most like easy to access form, right? Because you just like see these crazy headlines on on Bloomberg or whatever. But this one, I was like, what the fuck? Like, I don't yeah. know, new, new levels. Yeah, big time, and we definitely felt like this. Uh this uh black pill uh, uh doomer here and maybe you know maybe some of this kind of you know crazy accelerated uh capitalism is what fueled um some of the um uh impulse to use capital as a weapon that trevor was just talking about yeah um so totally. some of, some of these events may be laying the groundwork for what we saw earlier this year um, so this one was interesting. Hertz files for bankruptcy protection after stock traded plus 896% r slash Wall Street bets, the uh, Reddit group. Um, investors continue to pump the stock price via Robinhood, the app trading, the app for, for, for trading stocks. Hertz is recognized as the first meme stock. Um, so that is, so this is really crazy. The, they announced bankruptcy. <laughs> And then the and then the line goes up because there's because people are like flooding into the stock and so there's like a real a real moment where the uh, crazy kind of meme energy of crypto has bleeded over into the stock market and people are treating stocks that represent real companies as if it is a you know meme stock is something to just yeah. kind of like pump and dump exactly um, yeah which was 
yeah, I guess this was like, yeah. And then of course we saw that now, right? Totally with like Dogecoin and stuff. But this was, I guess, like the first iteration of like, I, I think people feel like like the main stock or whatever, is it 2021 sort of thing? But, I, but whenever like the stimulus checks, especially were hit in the USA, like these kids just fucking sticking it into <laughs> hurts. <laughs> that's like like that, that that has just said that it's like it's it's you know it's bankrupt, and uh, yeah yeah it, I don't know I've always thought it was kind of wild and I think a really beautiful cultural moment was the Wall Street bets Discord, and um this, Big this time. oh my yeah. god. That'll, that'll definitely be part of um, the uh, Codex 2021 for sure. Oh, is, was that 21? Oh, yeah, God. yeah, that yeah, that was January. And so, and that was kind of around the time we were putting together this chapter. So we were putting together the chapter with the hindsight of what would happen after. So the, the chapter is kind of about like kind of laying the groundwork of stock market becoming detached from reality and then turning into this kind of crazy speculative mean thing. Yeah. Um, and kind of working off of that, we have the uh, the Go Burr meme, oh. which was uh, instant classic um, on the Discord and throughout the the memeiverse. So we collected a bunch of them for spreads in the Stonks chapter. This is the first one that was posted to the Discord, and as you can see, it didn't get that many um, reacts. You know, it just got a couple reacts. Little did we know <laughs> that this would become the meme of the year. Um, <laughs> From uh, from a March tenth here, so I'll read it. I'll I'll read it out. And the guy on the on the left here um, is uh, it's in, it's in black and white here, but he's he's wearing the libertarian bow tie that's uh, yellow and black. So you know, really believing in the free market and that you don't want to um, uh, mess with the dynamics of the free market by creating like a stimulus package or printing money. So he says, no, you can't artificially inflate the economy by creating money to fight an economic downturn. You can't just change the market signals by using monetary policy. You're destroying the natural rate of investor Reno. No. And then we, and then we got the fed on the other side saying, ha ha money printer go burr. Um, so this was like, kind of like, one of these key moments where things started to become detached and the ideology that we've been told for so long kind of started to come on, come undone. Okay. Um, just a, just a brilliant moment. Truly, um, uh, truly stunning. Stunning. I, I feel like the, I feel like the, um, like this moment when the fed did just money printer go burr was whenever the whole trajectory of this thing just went crazy. Like this, I think going back through the timeline, we were this moment of the fed, like printing, whatever money, whatever that means. Like this is when the chaos kind of, uh, exploded, but we have some more of them. Do we? Yeah. 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 We got a couple more and we're, you know, we're kind of pressed for time. So we're going to kind of go through them quickly and kind of, uh, reminisce here. Um, so from here, just kind of after that first one, it just accelerated and got, you know, used for all different kinds of things. So this is about sending people back to work during the pandemic. I was like, no, you can't send people back to work during a pandemic. Millions will die. Ha ha. Blood sacrifices, the capital go burr. Um, just, just brilliant content here. This is one of my personal faves where the meme format is reduced down to just kind of its elemental, um, pieces. Uh, and here the fed guy is shooting the, uh, the, uh, zoomer libertarian with, with money out of the, ho- uh, the helicopter and with, uh, the burr sound coming out of the chopper. It's just like an incredible, incredible piece of content here. Um, we need to zoom out of that one a little bit. Yeah. It's like zoom out. Um, yeah. So D- everyone started using it. DJs. Um, here's the actual COVID vaccine and, uh, and, the cell membrane, just everything, uh, healthcare, please printer broke. And then finally the most black billion of all derivative markets go burn. We got this crazy vampire castle here and, uh, and stuff. So, so yeah, this is the stonks chapter. Check it out. I have, uh, I leaked some DMS with Dan explaining stonks to me. So check that out. Um, yeah, it's a good one. All right. Thanks so much. It was really, really nice chatting with you, Orla. Take take care over there. And uh, next up, we have um, Algorithms, who is going to be uh, uh, reading a glossary term. So thanks so much. Cheers, mate. Ciao.
Hey all, this is Nora. I am beaming in from Mexico, about two hours outside of Mexico City. Yeah, what do I think about 2020? What's a good visual metaphor for 2020 to capture the horrors of everything from climate change to regime changes to uh, nifty discourse? And there's been a lot of memes about 2020 being a trash fire. Honestly, it seems like 2021 is gonna be a trash fire as well. Maybe it's always been a trash fire. But the ocean on fire here in the Gulf seems like a pretty good one. And watching it, it seems like, yes, the world is totally unhinged and mystified. Or it's super explainable. It's capitalism and racism and racial capitalism and colonialism. Metaphors can really help us make sense of chaos and give us something visual to hang on to. And you know, helps position us like at a distance from the crisis. But, you know, I want to be on this boat and I want to be on that platform. I don't want to be in the water. I definitely don't want to be here. But we are probably in the water and in the fire and <laughs> on the platform all at once. These images are horrifying and mesmerizing, all of extraction welling up from infrastructure and creating little literal maelstrom watch these videos a lot because they do what charts and graphs and simulations can't really do. They make us think about our position in relation to what we're seeing. Maybe we're in the water and we're also in the fire too. Or maybe, you know, sometimes the ocean on fire is just the ocean on fire. See you, have fun.
Am I muted? All right. Sorry about that. Yeah, I was just saying how I had ascended to new levels, new uh, to like new log levels of, of media streams, but then I was on mute, so I guess I haven't. So I'm still back on the log level. Yeah, I'm. Uh... Yeah, I'm sick. Yeah, I'm like fully ascended right now. I'm um, just hanging out over here in Alston, hanging out with the green room, which uh, you can see next to me. Uh, we're about to open up this Zoom room. We're about to open up this pit. So if you're in the uh, live chat, you can come into the Zoom room and slightly de-virtualize a little bit more from chat to extemporaneously uh, video streaming to one another. So yeah, it's been a really fun uh, chat. We've been making some jokes, sharing some stories. Um, doing doing some uh some uh stocks analysis and uh yeah getting to the bottom of uh hegelian dialectics in the chat so it's been yeah it's been a great afternoon evening exciting it's exciting stuff exciting time to be on the internet so i'm stoked Yeah. That's the move. Oh, nice. Okay, cool. Everyone's flooding in. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, the stream. <laughs> Um, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wait, Will, Will has a very special, yeah. Hey, David. You're muted. Oh, man. Love it. That's like that. Is it reversed? Um, like the admin reveal. It's like reversed, I guess, because it's on the stream. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Oh, yeah. well, check out the Texas gang. So check out everyone muted. Yeah, Jack, do you have everyone muted, or what's, what's up with that? Oh, like, one open. Uh, okay. Only? Mm -hmm. All right, we can hear Texas gang. Cheers. Uh, wait, where's the oh, phone? <laughs> that's why. That's why. <laughs> Who's be able to unmute? All right, do we want to get a live react from the, the Texas game? Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, we're on the stream. <laughs> Hey, welcome. What? We need. <laughs> 